So hello, everyone here. So we're going to do a talk on, I guess, I would characterize this as uh, kind of a, an opinionated view we have on, you know, for people uh, looking to, I guess, move from traditional virtualization, looking to modernize what they have in light of recent disruptions and what we're seeing in the market, like whatever Broadcom is doing, what the general push from on-prem to public cloud, but then also where where might you be if you were to look at something on-prem? So, you know, in our case, we're looking at, you know, the, the combination of products that Red Hat brings to the table uh, to kind of facilitate that on-prem private cloud slash hyper cloud model. There, there are a number of customers that we have that are successfully leveraging um, our, our product suite with regards to OpenStack and, and portfolio. And uh, generally speaking here, there's a, this is kind of part of a broader talk track that we have. Um, this is kind of our, our, our quick and dirty kind of intro to where we see ourselves in, in this landscape and uh, the, the advantages and benefits we can provide customers. So just, just briefly about me, uh, I'm Greg, I support the National Sales Team of Canada for cloud and storage. I have been working in the IT industry for about 25 years and uh, a number of, uh, I guess, backgrounds from healthcare, public sector, telco, and FSI. Uh, been using OpenStack for just a little under four, uh, uh, just under eight years now, and been with Red Hat for just a little under four. So, uh, Generally, why, why are we here? As I mentioned earlier, you know, this is, you know, Red Hat is kind of dedicated towards transforming traditional IT models into agile software defined data centers using DevOps, cloud native technologies, and service level objectives. And this solution brief provides a blueprint for organizations aiming to adopt these advanced technologies and lead their IT transformation. So we're gonna, this is kind of the high level agenda what we're gonna talk about here. Um, you know, we're going to go through, well, have gone through most of the introduction. Uh, what we're, what's a little different here is rather than kind of talk like exclusively about technology, which is kind of the, the classic way we kind of address this kind of like bottom up engineering. What we're going to look at doing is, is tackling this from kind of a, a top down strategic point of view. Um, there's a gentleman named Roger Martin who has a strategy framework, which uh, we kind of incorporate into this presentation. Um, we'll then move on to the hyperscaler experience, essentially talk briefly about why people like them and why they're so wildly successful. And then how we see the Red Hat OpenStack platform fitting in alignment with uh, what the hyperscalers are doing. Um, you know, and then we're gonna get into a few problem statements and some solutions that are kind of common to customers that are undergoing this kind of digital transformation. Um, we're gonna look at how we can apply that strategy framework for that cloud transformation. And how that choice cascade, you know, uh, manifests in that cloud transformation. So briefly about Roger. So he is a renowned academic business consultant. Um, he's uh, been voted number one in uh, Thinkers 50, which is kind of a strategic uh, integrative thinking consortium. Um, he's uh, published a number of papers uh, for how to uh, I guess address uh, business problems with uh, with, with technology uh, business needs. So what we're looking at doing here is we're looking to kind of take this this the this five step kind of process, which Roger's outlined, which is you know like like what is your winning aspiration? So for example, here, you know we're talking about uh, an organization's primary vision. So for example, transitioning to a cloud based infrastructure, and then very discreetly where we want to play, you know, about selecting those operational areas, such as, uh, you know, making a decision to adopt something like Red Hat OpenStack for on-premise, uh, and then how you were going to win. Like, what, like when, when you look to move toward this type of a solution, you know, like there has to be some criteria as to, you know, like what strategy you would employ to be successful at what it is you're doing, how you would surpass competitors, you know, uh, you know, for example, uh, making strategic decisions on automation, like the, the incorporation automation of Ansible with your, your your cloud infrastructure, and then what are those core capabilities you know that um, are going to enable this? So those essential skills or technologies, uh, you know, and, and proficiencies required for you know being successful at this, and then what are the management, the powerful management systems we have in place to kind of run this whole show. 
And so with that, we're going to talk about just briefly, you know, from a, a hyperscaler point of view, you know, like one of the things that we find when talking with customers when they're looking to change everything is, you know, they, 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 they take very close or they pay very close attention to things like, you know, the ease of use and interoperability uh, between, you know, the capabilities in the public cloud, um, you know, from a standardization and comprehensive documentation, you know, like moving to the cloud, like they really have put a lot of effort into uh, making a very vast portfolio that's fairly easy to consume. You know, and so one of the things we've noticed is that, you know, the predominant industry preference leans towards the service model adopted by the major three hyperscalers and kind of aligns with business is shifting from traditional uh, setups. So when we look at now, I guess the, the Red Hat kind of take on the hyperscaler experience. So one of the things we have here in this concentric ring uh, diagram here is that at the very heart, you know, OpenStack provides a foundational level of, of capability, you know, like storage, networking, computing, management. And you know, outside of that ring, we do have a number of well-defined use cases. So you know, OpenStack is one of the dominant forces for things like NFE, AI, ML, HPC. Uh, we also see it used quite frequently in uh, dev, test clouds and so on. But where, like, I guess the purpose of this conversation where we're kind of looking at focusing is, again, in light of what's going on in the industry right now, we feel that there is a prime opportunity to kind of position uh, OpenStack for going after traditional enterprise and hosting services. We kind of qualify the enterprise hosting services. Uh, most mid to large enterprises um, are hosting providers of the sort. There is some app that they can't modernize. It's just a thing they have to run and provide some vital uh, business service, and they have to figure out how to live with it. Um, there's not really an opportunity to containerize it or modernize it, and so they, they you know, like there, there has to be some some thought or mechanism to kind of live with that and so uh, like and having come from primarily that those type of organizations um you know this is where uh, there are a lot of similarities between what you would find with a traditional hosting provider or a hyperscale of what these mid to large enterprises are doing and then finally on the outside we have this like um you know the the portfolio of products that are very tightly integrated with what we're doing at red hat with regards to um, private and, and hybrid cloud, whether you know it's shift on stack or the SAP integration or you know the, the Ansible integration into OpenStack. There's just a, a very um, powerful interplay between all of these technology capabilities and solutions that uh, we look to, or we, we tend to see as a competitive advantage uh, that we're able to bring to customers. So much like the earlier slide with regards to the hyperscaler experience. You know, we see that OpenStack integrates fairly seamlessly with orchestration tools like Ansible. And, you know, you can position things like infrastructure as code via GitOps, you know, simplifying transitions with DevOps practices. You know, the Red Hat OpenStack platform ensures standardization and interoperability. I mean, we're, uh, Red Hat is a fairly trusted name in the industry for, uh, you know, that, that type of stuff. Um, laptops, please. So when we talk about, you know, from a maturity and stability point of view, um, you know, we kind of see ourselves as being, you know, uh, another kind of mature and trusted on par with what we see with the hyperspace. We actually work very closely with them uh, with, you know, with regards to deploying our products in cloud, both uh, in public and on prem. So one of the things here, I guess, when we talk about uh, the standards that we've gotten used to. So this this example here is, uh, it's a typical kind of um, expectation, that, that minimum level of uh, what a customer would expect when they're looking to deploy a, a cloud data center. So there, there's these four pillars, right? You know, you expect that there's, there's going to be something that can run my workload. There's going to be, I, I expect there's going to be there something there that provides networking for those workloads, storage for those workloads, and ultimately, management of those workloads. And so one of the things that we find is that like, well, like, well, everyone expects this, we find that open source map, the open source data center equivalent maps very well to it, right? So much like what we saw in the proprietary cloud data center model, from an open stack point of view, we have all the same buttons, just, you know, different open source projects. And where we see 
Red Hat kind of taking that open source data center model and extending it is in our product portfolio. So you know, like OpenShift, OpenStack, Ceph, Ansible, these are all the uh, tested enterprise uh, software portfolio solutions that, you know, essentially we're talking about de-risking, you know, your, your, your day two, right? This is a, a situation where, you know, uh, we let customers focus on running their businesses and not necessarily, you know, becoming a development house for OpenStack. That seemed to be the temperature of the room with the majority of mid to large enterprises that we've been talking with over the last couple of years. So one of the, the things that uh, I like to kind of bring to your attention as well is like the, word, the term hybrid cloud is thrown around quite a bit. And so one of the things that, you know, we find is that uh, when you look at Ansible, Ansible is kind of this, this great lever, right? It's able to do so many different things. And one of the, the capabilities that uh, we've been kind of educating customers on is that how you can le you can leverage Ansible and its integration both in traditional virtualization technologies as well as uh, the hyperscalers themselves to strategically uh, move workloads, you know, around as you need them. Like if you can if you contrast this against what for example, a uh, hyperscaler native toolkit. So whether you're using AWS Migrate or, or the, the migration services from Azure, it's a one-way trip. Like once your VM leaves your data center, it never, it, there's no there's no mechanism for it to easily move back down out of cloud. So there, it's kind of a fundamental business model of theirs to you know, get, uh, suck up as much of those workloads and, and, and position them in those public clouds you know, um, as easily as possible, but you know, one thing you, you will probably, you may have heard is that a lot of customers that do that, you know, about, I may need to plug my laptop down. Honestly. Uh, Sorry, one second, folks. So anyways, one of the things well, I'm getting plugged in here. Yeah, so we've noticed that there's no real great way to get out of the cloud other than rebuilding. There's no migration capability that's kind of easy to do that. So one of the things we focused on is bringing awareness to things like Ansible and those modules that we have for things like Hyper-V and VMware and Nutanix, as well as you know the the uh, the, the hyperscalers themselves. And so what we're looking, what we're really trying to say is hybrid cloud for customers should really be about choice, right? It should be about, I run workloads where they make sense to run workloads, right? So if there is something in public cloud that is advantageous for those workloads, you know, so for example, I may have a batch job that requires a substantial amount of GPU power to get a chunk of work done, but then I don't need it, or those workloads can maybe relocate in a, in a smaller subset somewhere else. That is where we want it, what people start thinking rather than just like, I'm stuck here and how do I make the best of it? So one of the things I guess, when we talk about, you know, uh, customer experiences and also, you know, knowledge we, we've gained from our partnerships with the hyperscalers is, you know, you know, one of the foundations of kind of cloud performance is in establishing service level objectives. You know, because when you think about it, hyperscalers have this really interesting problem, you know, and and, and they've solved it quite eloquently. Um, they have a requirement that they must be able to run any workload with loose to no requirements at any time. <laughs> and so that is that is a very interesting problem to solve. And so the way they've done that is they have essentially uh, created a menu of service level objectives of which customers of their service can consume their, their cloud. And so that has allowed them to be, you know, extremely malleable and adaptive. And so those lessons haven't been lost on us. And so one of the things that we find that is um, kind of like a best practice is kind of emerging is that when you are looking to deploy something like OpenStack, you know, taking special attention to, you know, defining the unit of consumption, um, you know, creating service level objectives that can be met and metered against, um, you know, starts at 
taking things like capacity planning, forecasting, changing them from I need a tool to do it or some type of magic agent that goes out and figures it out to something more academic, right? It's like from your, your, your day one point of view, I build a cloud, you know, being able to go in there, um, exercise the cloud using Rally or Browbeater or whatever tool you're using, and then create uh, profiles and, you know, units of consumption such as volume types or, or different types of flavors that we'll get into a little bit later um, on how you can kind of uh, portion out what it is you deliver. And it's no longer like how fast can my cloud go? It's more how much can I deliver within the cloud before I need to scale? Now, that's kind of uh, that change in mindset from the go from kind of build and they will come to kind of policy and prediction for what it is you're doing. And so as an example here, you know, like, uh, you know, whether it's replicating something like AWS GP2 and GP3 volumes, you know, which, which you guys are familiar is I over gigabyte or fixed performance IO, or if you are doing deterministic over subscription, so recreating the mechanism that the AWS Nitro uses for doing deterministic over subscription of instances and service guarantees so that the VMs don't clobber each other, you know, or if you're, if you're looking to do like uh, traffic peering, you know, between different networks, you know, like these are all kind of these building blocks that um, when you're looking to stand up your cloud, getting that kind of figured out really helps with kind of living with it. And so one of the things just to kind of change gears here, um, one of the things we've been kind of socializing customers as well is that like, because they, they say, like, how does cloud bring value? Like, that's all really cool. but. How do I transform my, my traditional legacy workloads, right? Like it's great that we have this amazing plumbing and I can define the unit of consumption, but how might I take cloud native and modernize, you know, old ass applications, right? And so uh, a thought that has occurred to us and it's kind of lessons that we've learned from other things is positioning, for example, uh, cloud to enhance in, in patching. And so like life cycle operations are kind of a, a thing that everybody does for the moment, especially in these traditional environments. And, um, you know, by leveraging things like system storage, the center, right? And uh, capabilities like, you know, uh, like we, we, we just recently showcased the Red Hat Image Builder, which is uh, a, a toolkit slash service that you can get on cloudredhat.com for customizing RHEL images, you know, and then using cloud in it to program in identity and configuration. You, you have this mechanism where the life cycle of a host can really start looking like a software pipeline, right? Where the, the app is the OS image, and then all the customization that all customers do for the most part, right? There's some type of hardening that occurs, some, you know, like configure these are my, my logging server, whatever it is your organization does. That can go into, you know, edits that get streamed into the image and then you know, unit testing with Ansible, with a, a, other mechanisms to make sure that when the new version of, you know, when, when for example, Red Hat pushes out a new a new point release of Red, or, you know, this is not limited to Red Hat either. I mean, when Microsoft has a, a new point release of uh, Windows Server that you've got cloud-based and it's streamed into it, you have this pipeline to kind of create the, the latest and greatest version with your customizations. And when you talk about, well, again, how does that, like, improve life cycle for me. Well, consider uh, a workflow that runs that's leveraging this. So a new version of the opera system comes out, the pipeline generates the latest customized image. When you look to patch, quote unquote, life cycle, what you're really doing is you're having that workload take a knee, you're detaching the data volumes, which are being held by a sender, and then you are rehydrating the latest version of the customized image using cloud in it punch the identity back into it. And if that kind of sounds familiar, it is, because that's what we do with containers, right? They're just the data mounts. The images are immutable. So cloud is letting me take the lessons that I've learned from containerization and apply them to traditional workloads. So much like, um, I guess the extension of that is where you would then take, for example, a uh, your customized image and then Application teams in your environment would fork that project as they would any other GitHub project. And so now I can take the base OS image that my my, my corporation has deemed this is this is our minimum. And then I can start layering in, you know, that DB2 database, that Oracle database, all the customizations that are required to kind of make this now a thing that I can consume. And what, what we're really turning this into is this this catalog of capabilities where we kind of take 
the layered customized image now, so face and whatever your application is. And then we can position things like, just as an example, like, you know, Ansible and, and to do the, the detailed mobile configuration upon deployment or positioning things like heat to stand to configure network storage, you know, uh, security groups in a persistent way. Like th this is ultimately creating, you know, shift left opportunities for an internal marketplace. Because when, when we think about it, you know, I mean, it, it's great from, from a technologist's point of view to have all this really cool stuff, but, you know, what's valuable to a business. So again, as we map back to Roger's framework, you know, the, the competitive advantage, the core capabilities that we are, are leveraging to win in the area that we're, we're targeting is that we don't necessarily want or need super technical people to do this, right? We're, we have all this framework and tooling in place that I can capture this in, a, in you know, a service now catalog that triggers a workflow that provisions this. And then I can hand that off to a call center. Like, this is this is the value to business. This is this is where we see and what we have seen the hyperscalers position to be super successful at what it is they're doing. So uh we'd like to get into just hey Craig, before you go, I think there's a question on the sure. chat if you don't mind handling. Uh so Craig is asking, is there a tool process that allows us to make identity IPA into a VM image deploy? Currently handle all that by a post. Install Ansible place. Is there a pro sorry, is there so is there, there is there a process to bake identity management into? Yeah, to bake identity like IPA into a VM a VM image deploy. Absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. So uh, sorry. If, if you were done with that. So so, so yes, the answer is yes. And uh baking in uh like so, Red Hat IBM. So this is like, like so you're talking about free IPA, but then Red Hat IBM. Is this what, what the question is about? How to make that? Uh, I don't know, Kurt. Can you uh, are you able to get uh, voice? Uh, I don't know if you can speak or just type. Uh, uh, I think I could speak. Can you hear me? <laughs> yep. Yes, you can hear. Oh, good, good. I have a voice. <laughs> um, yeah, I, uh, just one of the things that's on my mind often as I roll out images. Uh, I'd like to roll out baked images that I provide um, um, IPA access through group roles, uh, roles that are defined by groups onto systems. And what I'd like to be able to do is, is have all of that baked into an image. So when it deploys, I can tell it you're, you are this thing. And as it deploys, it, it does that. I, I don't know if there's a way I can do that in a, in a, Free step. I guess I could do it in the cloud in it now that I'm saying it out loud. Um, yeah, I, I was going to say, so that, that's actually, so it's funny, in, a, in another life, I was uh, an IPA domain expert. So um, I would leverage cloud in it for that. So in IPA, you have this uh, the notion of, of, uh, of the OTP, the one time key. And so right. new host enrollment can generate an OTP, which can be streamed into the bootstrap process by a cloud in it. So when that image comes up, you can you can have that configuration data for the instantiation of that workload to have to facilitate that auto registration inside of it. So that's like a, a, a standard a, a standard thing, right? Okay, I just, I just haven't done it. So yeah, that now that we talk talk about it out loud, it does make sense. Okay, thanks. Just good question. Good question. Okay. Um, sorry. Yeah, uh, Jonathan Mills uh, with NASA. Um, the biggest problems that we've ha ever had with image building is that um, uh, images uh, tend to be one flat partition a lot of times and federal government uh, in conjunction with like NIST and CIS benchmarks uh, to pass our security scan, we, we have a minimum of like six different partitions. Yeah. It, it's like slash, bar, bar log, bar log, office, bar temp, temp, I mean, and so like stuffing all those different partitions into a dynamically built VM image has been tricky. Yeah, so I mean there are there are a number of different ways to handle that from a from an image builder point of view. Like I know that Red Hat is actively uh, like I believe we actually pursue common criteria certification. One of those things is to have, for example, those separate partitions. 
ancient stuff about filling up file systems, right? Like I get it. And so by leveraging something like a proper software pipeline, so whether you're using GitLab, GitHub, whatever it is for your actions, you know, these are our customization steps that can either be done by image builder itself or, you know, in the pipeline via something like Ansible going in and turning those into, into volumes, right? Like, it is Red Hat Image Builder different from from Dib, the Disk Image Builder? So, or you just see OpenStack on this, like ironic uses. The yeah. So, Im Image Builder, we just uh, we just showcased that this year at Red Hat Summit. Okay. So, so that's different. it is. Yeah. So, it was originally a CLI, but now it's it, you can actually um, you can prototype it through CloudRedHat.com. So, there's like a web interface to it now, but there is a CLI to it as well. So that's. Okay. It's something we can talk a little offline about. Okay, sure. Yeah, no problem. But yes, there, there, there's powerful mechanisms available, both from what Image Builder can do, from what Ansible can do, and from what CloudInit can do from a bootstrap point of view as well. Uh, the point is, though, is that by leveraging the, the pipeline approach to delivering uh, gold images, all of that standardization, whatever your requirements are, so you from a compliance point of view, you would have that done in pipeline and the release of the, the NASA 1.0 image for that release would be something like produced by that pipeline. People would base their work off that work. And it is very much a layered approach, right? So that is kind of what we're doing. So we start with the stock image for the disk image builder. We boot that into a VM and OpenStack. We lay in with Ansible, all of our benchmarks and compliances. We snap dots to prep that image and that becomes a gold one. That is pushed out to bare metal or, or VM and then is configured by other public or Ansible more for whatever that particular purpose is. And the partition bit is tricky because it's yeah. Sure. It's like, yeah, it's I was like a snap. Snap. Uh, Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah sure. So I, I guess to, to summarize, there's there are new tools that uh, Red Hat has uh, has uh, made public that uh, may facilitate that. But it's also I think it would be taking steps similar to what you were doing yourselves and uh, positioning them as part of a uh, software development pipeline where like so let's say you have a new requirement like the standard changes and you need to you know uh, tweak something in the image that goes in as its own branch right you know you create a branch you apply your change you, you run your unit testing based on on like standard devops processes someone reviews the change they, re they review the workload and then it gets merged in. You have a 1.1 and a 2.0 release. And that's just a really good way of doing it, right? Because from a, uh, an audibility point of view and a compliance point of view, like one of the things we'll talk about a little bit later is part of why you would look at changing your, your uh, philosophy or methodology to doing or to conducting business is that uh, most organizations have some type of change control in place, right? You have some change records. That, that's, that was just beaten in everybody's heads in the 90s. I tell for everyone, right? And so, but it is, it is a, an important part of how companies manage risk. And by implementing things, industry standards like software pipelines for delivering infrastructure, you get to have a different conversation with business where it's just like, I'm looking to deliver services and content, but I, I want to move towards um, pre-approved changes. And they'll say, well, in order to have a pre-approved change for that agility, you have to have certain controls and audits in place. The software development pipeline is a really good way of doing that, right? So uh, in any case, so we're going to get through three very kind of um, uh, top of mind problem statements that we, we've been having with, with customers. Um, so the first one is I have legacy workloads that live in existing virtualization systems and or bare metal and need to be able to move them as is to new solution without disrupt without disrupting their use. Um, you know, and so this is typically what we look at as a, a lift and shift, but the lift and shift from traditional virtualization um, to OpenStack. We're, we're going to leverage some of that good plumbing inside of OpenStack. So we have this notion of, uh, of, of a super tenant. And so if you consider what like vSphere is, what Hyper-V looks like, what even RAM looks like, right? These, these traditional, these traditional um, virtualization technologies. I mean, if you talk to any of those admins that we have, um, you know, they're used to having all their workloads 
in a single pane of glass, and they'll typically have their VMs plumbed with, you know, VLANs from all like all different parts of their network, and you know, this is this is this is what this is how they 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 need things to be until they are ready to uplift their workloads, and we were able to recreate that traditional, uh, I guess, management monolith inside of OpenStack logically. I mean, so for the OpenStack folks here that are familiar, I mean, like this is nothing more than creating a tenant with a number of provider network based routers that VMs have, that have ports that are, are provisioned on. Them. And so the advantage of this approach, and again, there's a lot about strategy of how I would convert from traditional to OpenStack is that you don't boil the ocean with reinventing how access and networking is done for, for the workloads. So all of the firewalls, all of the infosec processes, all of the chain uh, workflows that are required for provisioning and, and maintaining access to those VMs still exist. And so this, how this plays out is the workload that lives in vSphere, Rev, or Hyper-V takes a name. It gets migrated. And then when it comes up, the ports that are attached to it have the same MAC addresses, it's the same IP addresses, it's on the same provider networks. So those, all of those VMs don't know that anything's changed, right? It comes up and everything just works. But it is, it's an important first step for like getting people moved without making it this, this unbelievably daunting task. Um, let me see here. So our second problem statement is that I have workloads that can run in a cloud native fashion and are being hosted in a legacy virtualization system, and I need to pivot those workloads to the new solution. So one of the things that we find with a lot of customers is a lot of them have deployed OpenShift or, or Kubernetes, right? Like I'm, I'm going to be agnostic here um, because the, the, the solution works for both. So whether it is a, you know, Flavor X Kubernetes distribution or OpenShift, running in vSphere, running in Hyper-V, running in Rev or whatever. Um, by positioning Red Hat Advanced Cluster Manager, you're able to manage those Kubernetes clusters and then you're able to do a workload migration. So this is a, a fairly simple, fairly straightforward way of going from old to new. So you would stand up new Kubernetes or OpenShift clusters in OpenStack. You have a very good story with running OpenShift on OpenStack. Um, and ACM would be then you would have the kubelet operator or Helm chart, it's Kubernetes, installed inside of your Kubernetes cluster. And you would do a workload pivot from ACM, which would then redeploy the application, you know, recreate all the other bits as part of the, the deployment um, on the other node, and then cut away the old nodes. So whether you were a, a legacy application or a container-based application, there is a fairly straightforward way of migrating leveraging something like ACM or Ansible in the migration. Is there, is there a question? Or? Last problem statement is not really a technology problem statement. This is, so this is more about our central IT model creates bottlenecks, limits, uh, it limits scalability, slows innovation within the entire burden on one team, and efficiencies arise, costs increase, and responsiveness to business demand increases. So, who here has, has heard or has been living, has lived the situation of, I'd love to do that, but I just don't have any time, right? And th this is, it, yeah, exactly, right? So I'm sure, I'm sure everybody is, has experienced that at one point. I know when, you know, when I did from a different life, that was, there was never any time really to do anything because it's so many plates you were spinning. And so this is pump, and we're gonna briefly talk about why that is when we see it. So when we talk about new business, you know, that's typically a number of new applications and new technology, perhaps that's being considered and ultimately new expectation associated with that new business. And traditionally that gets funneled through central IT and central IT digests all of that and they come up with some type of service delivery. And so, but like when you think about that digestive process, well, what is central IT actually doing? Well, there's a whole bunch of stuff that they do, whether it's, you know, coming up with the requirements for security, for monitoring, compliance, you know, setting a schedule, figuring out capacity management for the new thing. There's a whole bunch of thoughts that go into this. They get pushed down on central IT. And so what happens is that as your business scales and you start getting more and more projects kicking off, you end up getting these kind of discrete little work packages that get funneled through that central IT organization. And the problem is, is that you, know, you end up getting this operational bandwidth contention with your people. You end up just, just too much. And that, that's kind of where we get into the, the whole, like, yeah, I'll deal with it next month, right? I've got 20 other things that I'm doing. 
you know, and so we kind of liken this to, you know, high school or college, right, where you would have different subjects you would do on different day, and the more subjects you ended up taking, generally speaking, the quality of the work would get. We're, we're only human, and time slicing has diminishing returns. And so it's very, it's very true when you look at these traditional central IT organizations. You know, and so one of the one of the typical answers we'll hear from them is, "Well, I can just scale the IT organization. This is a problem money can solve." And unfortunately, that's not true either, right? So what we find is that as IT organizations grow in number, you end up getting uh, final knowledge or tri tribal knowledge. So the uh, you know it becomes less about the technology and more about you know. Well, Bob knows how this customer likes their application. He knows their tolerances. He's familiar when they can take outages. Can't ever lose power, right? Bob can't take vacation either. Bob isn't a very happy guy most of the time. And I'm sure everybody at some point has been Bob, right? And so uh, we, the, there are these diminishing returns with scaling that central IT organization. And interestingly enough, it was a problem the hyperscalers had to deal with as well, and they came up with a fairly interesting solution for it. So our recommendation is kind of a reverse engineering of what these organizations have been doing very well. And so what they've essentially done is uh, they've created this uh, strategic compartmentalization of how they run their organization. So in, in this example, and in the context of what we're here today, let's just talk about an open stack or a cloud team and a line of business team. You know, so a line of business being maybe the consumer of, of, of the infrastructure, right? So what would the cloud team take care of? Well, there's a really interesting DMARC point. Much like the hyperscalers, the cloud team would be responsible for cloud, all the as service components, software point networking, all of that. But in addition, the lifecycle CI of the infrastructure. So your compute nodes in the environment, right? You know, and which compute nodes, like from what vendor, Typically, you need some oversight on that. You just can't let people have too much of a free reign, but there are some interesting ways of delineating and provisioning that out for, for management by customers. But generally speaking, they focus on, on making sure the cloud is running and providing services. Well, what about the LOD team? The LOD is your classic customer, your consumer of the cloud. These are the people that we've found there are, while there are many personas inside of these, these, these organizations, there are three that stand out. You have the line of business, site reliability, and change. So the person that much like you would see in AWS or Azure, these are the guys that are provisioning the infrastructure, creating security groups, all the policies created for running your operation from a technical point of view. Then you have your developers. This is the other major persona that you will be finding inside of customers, That's writing the applications, putting them together, and then some type of BSA, some business analyst that is administrating the services that the developers create that runs on the infrastructure that, that the SREs provide. And uh, the idea here is that, or what the hyperspace figured out is that by providing this strategic compartmentalization, you know, like it's almost hubris to think that a central organization would know a line of business has been better than the line of business themselves, right? And there are substantial advantages to that, where, for example, a line of business may like know the tolerances of their customers. The central cloud team doesn't need to know when that customer can take outages. Their SRE does. Just like when we look with AWS, like AWS doesn't care when your servers are down as long as it wasn't their fault, right? It just has to do with, like they, they let you take care of that. They're just there to provide services. And so when you look at this as kind of like a 50,000 foot view, you have this decoupled, disaggregated, scalable operator. So in the sense that I have my central cloud team, but they are detached at arm's length enough away from where the workloads run as to be able to continue doing at a very focused scale, right? And they let customers worry about customer things. And there are, outside of the hyperspace, there are a number of very interesting open stack references. If you look at, have you ever been, uh, have you ever been to a CERN talk at Open Infra? That's like seven guys. That's probably like the largest open stack cloud in the world. Well, they are getting in the weeds of the scientists and the organizations that come in to run particle physics on the LHC. So this is a model that you know works, it's proven. It's not that oh red hat are so smart. It's like, no, we've been paying attention. And we're trying to get people aware of what these like 
how can cloud enhance my business? Well, it's not about technology, it's not about workflows and automation. It's also about bringing and evangelizing the way the rest of your organization and the way you consume the cloud works. Now, like move away from those central IT, you know, uh, deployment patterns and thought patterns and move toward what is proven successful. We see in private and public cloud. So we kind of move on to uh, the strategy framework for cloud transformation. So, you know, this all, I mean, essentially what we're talking about when we circle back to Roger's framework is that to succeed in cloud transformation, you know, one has to identify the key challenges, you know, such as like technical debt, skill gaps, and ultimately align those things with, with your organization's strengths. So, you know, for example, expertise in DevOps, like, you know, or cloud native technology, an emphasis on an iterative improvement a cultivation of culture that embraces those uh, constant changes and in, in innovation. You know, and when we position things like DevOps methodologies, which you know allow for the customization as a specific, you know, images using you know uh, gold technique, uh, enhancing operational resilience, you know, employing more of that cloud native approach to handle things like virtual machine lifecycle. Um, you know, positioning things like orchestration tools, whether it's you know, Ansible or Heat or whatever your, you know, the, the flavor of orchestration. Like, I, I mean, I, I would have said Terraform, but that that's kind of shaky right now. Uh, so, you know, like, but regardless, there, there's a, a number of different ways to do it. But just kind of taking that, you know, that approach to automating in a in a repeatable pipeline uh, driven manner. You know, and then positioning things like service level objectives for managing customer expectations. Because, you know, especially when you look at that disaggregated model, it's like that cloud team, you know, like they're not in the weeds with the customers anymore, right? Or the consumers of the cloud. So, you know, they need to look at, you know, creating an environment where, much like when you go into public cloud, like there's no volume I can provision in, in AWS, EBS that will drain your sand. Awesome. They have tight policy controls on what an IO1, IO2 volume can do, what a GP2, GP3 volume can do, you know, and like we can do the exact same thing. Like, like Cinder is very, very powerful in that regard. And, you know, or how we would position things like, you know, leveraging uh, C group tiering. It's actually part of a different talk that we have on how we can position C groups to kind of provide service guarantees for. You know, running uh, virtual machines at different performance domains. You know, gold, silver, bronze. Garrett use the clock frequency of the of the processor on the compute node as a dimension for oversubscription when you can apply a guarantee. But that that notion of service level objectives being defined is kind of that secret sauce. And then finally, we get to the the choice cascade in that where we look at taking strategic decisions like you know adapting. Or sorry, adopting a cloud native approach, uh, then move to operational choices such as determining what key technology and platforms you're looking to use, and lastly making tactical decisions that influence daily operations based on that foundational strategic and operational choice. And ultimately, that choice cascade, you know, enhances operational efficiency by aligning decisions. You know, ease transition of workloads from legacy to cloud native systems by empowering those lines of business with responsive line teams. But like I'll circle back. Ultimately, it is about the power of choice, right? You know, that that um, that choice cascade transcends the technology, it focuses on organizational transformation, innovation, and scalability, but making informed decisions within this, this cascade future proof organization, ensuring resiliency and adaptability as you grow, as you scale. You know, like, you're not being pigeonholed anymore. And then transitioning uh, to a disaggregated operational model, which, you know, overall boosts efficiency, as we've seen with hyperscalers, empowering business sectors by integrating DevOps and cloud native technologies. Uh, you know, like, like DevOps is, is not just for containers, it can be for everything. These are just ultimately just what we've learned from this journey as it can be applied to traditional workloads. And that was the whirlwind tour. So um, we have, I think, a little time for questions. If there are any others, it was a lot. <laughs> uh, can I get copies of your slides? 
There's someone <laughs> here asking for it too. And, and, uh, people noted that you have customer and partners that are really required. There, yeah, there, there, there will be some slides we will be able to share. Um, I won't be able to sh share this deck specifically, not not yet. Um, this is this is kind of a new angle we've been kind of pursuing lately, like in light of what's been going on right, with with Broadcom and so on. I think there's a pretty interesting opportunity here for your traditional mid to large enterprises. Um, so, but. For anyone that's interested, um, if they can send a note to Chris, we'll make sure that we get something out to you guys. Yeah, 